All right. So to conclude this first uh, session, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Binitz, who is an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University, both in the Department of Computer Science and uh, the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Weizmann Institute of Science. His research is broadly in the algorithms, uh, with a focus on uh, approximation algorithms, graph algorithms, and distributed algorithms, and the theory of computer networking. And now he's going to give us a talk about data center topologies, X and beyond. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great. Thanks uh, so much for the intro. Uh, so yeah, so this is like a long session, right? We've already been here about three hours, so I'm going to try to keep this talk, you know, pretty light, pretty easy, not do too much math. Uh, so, you know, there's no kind of rush to get to the end. So, you know, just jump in, let's be informal and, and because, you know, it's been a while. Um, yeah, so this is about kind of data centers and it's good that I kind of followed up on Stefan because he already kind of talked about some of this stuff. Uh, so for example, my first slide, right, is just that data centers are important, right? Which hopefully you already know uh, from what Stefan said. Oh, and I should also add, I should, before I go, because Stefan very nicely uh, gave credit to all of his uh, collaborators for making slides. Like, you'll be, it'll be very obvious that all of the ugly slides are ones that I made, and all of the nice looking slides are ones that, like, my collaborator Asaf Valadarsky has made. So if you see nice slides, uh, give credit to Asaf, and if you see ugly slides, that's because I have no design sense at all. Um, but okay, so data centers are important. Uh, you know, just some things to emphasize from the perspective of kind of distributed computing, right, is that uh, data centers are, you know, a single company, right? So this is kind of different, right? A lot of what we talk about in distributed computing is kind of really individual agents. Uh, and we kind of don't have that in data centers. So even there, there's kind of two kinds of data centers in, in some sense, right? There's ones that like Google's data centers, right? So the whole thing is just running Google. Right? And then there's like AWS data centers, right? So Amazon runs these, but lots of other different companies kind of rent out space and kind of operate their own little mini stuff inside of this one big data center. So, you know, you can host many companies, but still like these data centers are designed and run and engineered by one company, right? So it's a single, uh, single thing. Uh, the other interesting thing is that you have these really extreme performance demands, right? So again, along with data centers being important, right? There's just like billions of dollars on the line for kind of everything that happens inside of data centers. So, you know, little constants matter, right? And somehow this like really hurts my soul as a person from approximation algorithms who kind of thinks that big O of one and big O of log N, you know, I like big O's, um, but like it's the case, right? Like constants really, really matter. Um, you know, you can't just say O of log N and, and be okay with that. Um, so, but this makes problems interesting. Uh, okay. So I'm going to try to do two things today. Uh, I'm going to first kind of give this overview of kind of quote unquote modern and industrial data center topologies. Um, this is again, I, I'm not a networking person. I'm a, an approximation algorithms and distributed computing person, uh, but I kind of dabble in, in networking. And so this is kind of my point of view on this, which may or may not be the same point of view of actual networking people. Uh, but I'll try to kind of provide references to the actual networking papers so you can kind of read it for yourself and see. Um, and I'm going to start out with this in part because like, you know, one of the things that you see a lot in or every once in a while in like POTSI and DISC papers are claims about something being useful in data centers. And if you're going to make that claim, like you should actually understand what is going on inside of a modern data center, right? So I'm going to try to kind of at least show you uh, the high level of what these modern topologies look like and give you some pointers so then you can go look it up and, and uh, uh, kind of know what you're talking about the next time you write a POTSI paper that claims something about data centers. Uh, and then the second part of the talk is going to be kind of our work or what I've been doing with, uh, you can see this is all with Michael Shapira, whoops, uh, Michael Shapira from the Hebrew U and his students, uh, Asaf Oladarsky and Gal Shahaf. Uh, so, I'm really only going to talk about this middle one, um, but I want to kind of, I really like this project. So I work on a lot of different things, but like, I really like this data center project in part because like, you can see the breadth of the stuff here, right? So, uh, you know, we have this Conex paper. This is a pure systems thing, 
right? And then we have like an algorithms paper, right? And then we have like a pure graph theory paper, right? So we're kind of like doing this whole range of like, let's talk about data centers, but there's algorithmic issues, there's purely graph theoretic issues, there's systems issues, and we can think about all of these. Um, and I think it's kind of really cool that often, you know, most of the, most of the projects that we all work on, right, you're doing like one or the other. So kind of doing all of these things and for one project for me has been really fun. Um, so I want to encourage you to work on data centers, then you too will get to, you know, do all three of these things. Okay, and this is kind of going along with what I just said, right, like when people say data center architectures, like today, because this is, you know, this workshop on realistic uh, graphs, we're really going to you know, care about what the graph looks like for the data center. It's called the network topology. But of course, like there's a lot of other things that go into a full load architecture that really end up mattering a lot. How I do routing, right? So like Stefan just talked about this a bit. Uh, how I do congestion control, like that really matters. Um, there's a lot of, you know, how I handle faults, like sure, right? There, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that's not just what is the graph, right? So here we're just gonna focus on what is the graph. Uh, most of my work on this is just focused on what is the graph, but of course, like when we're building a real system, like the systems paper that I kind of showed you, like congestion control and routing in particular become like massively important. Uh, so I have some backup slides if we have time where I can talk about that, but like that's not going to be the goal, but you know, this is something to keep in mind. Right? That, like we can't just ignore these other issues. Okay, so I want to claim, right, as theoreticians, right? Like we like thinking about performance a lot, right? This is like one of our favorite things to do along with, you know, fault tolerance and, and other things, but like performance is kind of our bread and butter. Uh, and we can talk about that, right? Throughput, um, path diversity, completion time, scheduling, like come up with a bunch of notions of what I mean by performance in a data center. And there's no right one, there's no wrong one, there's different settings, like, okay, fine, right? It's all some notion of performance. But what I want to point out is that there's other things other than performance, which we call deployability, which I don't know if that's the best word. Um, but this has both kind of formal and informal parts to it, right? Like, if I want to kind of build a data center graph, like, it's not just has to be high performance, it has to be like doable, right? Like, it has to be cheap. My cabling can't be like crazy expensive. Right, like I can't use 10 million routers, right? Because uh, that would be too expensive, right? So there's kind of actual honest to God costs. Then there's the like deployment, right? Like even if I use few cables, like if they're kind of running all over the place, like how am I actually going to put this in a warehouse, right? Like I have to actually be able to do that, right? And then there's maybe even more interesting like psychological issues, right? Like you know, I can propose this data center to Google, like I'm not the one running it, right? Like if I propose it to them, the people that run the data center, the people that are you know, sitting in the data center eight hours a day, like handling stuff that comes up, they better be able to understand what's happening, right? So it has to be kind of quote unquote, easy to reason about, right? Like I can't give some like crazy math thing that the network operators are not gonna be able to kind of understand what's happening. And so this is a little fuzzy, right? There's no definition of like, what is a crazy math thing that isn't understandable, right? But you know, hopefully this is a like, we know it when we see it, like we need reasonable-ish looking things. Okay, so fat trees, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute are kind of the, to some extent, the dominant modern data center um, or, or their yeah, so variants of fat trees. And these are very deployable. That's why everyone uses them. They're easy to reason about. They're nice. Um, they're relatively cheap. Uh, they have, you know, good performance, much better than what came before them. But, you know, I'm going to put them at the bottom of this performance. because Now, you know, we're trying to do next-gen data centers and have much, much better performance. Right? So there's been a whole bunch of proposals on what your next generation data center should look like. I'm not going to go through these. Some of these are like, super interesting. All of them are actually super interesting. Um, we're not going to really talk about that. I'm going to talk more about, uh, oops, am I frozen? Okay. About these uh, jellyfish in particular, uh, which is up there, and also slim fly. Oops, so I think I'm delayed from what I'm seeing on my iPad to this thing, but hopefully this works. So jellyfish and slim fly are these next generation things that kind of have 
even more performance, and they kind of show in their papers that they have this insanely good performance. They're both relatively non-deployable. And I'm going to try to argue that, uh, you know, we can kind of get the best of both worlds uh, by working on these expander data centers uh, in this top right corner. Can you guys see this expander? I'm showing it on my screen, but it's not showing up on like my mirror things. Can you see this thing up in the top right corner that says question mark expander? Uh, not yet. No, okay. So there's yeah. so some massive delay here happening. So at, at some point it showed up. Ah, now yes. It just showed oh, yeah. up. Okay, yeah. so I don't know, I'll try to keep going and hope it fixes itself. Uh, let's see what happens. No, I'm massively delayed. Okay, let me uh, try stopping the share. Sure. And restarting. Oops. Okay, so okay, so now I'm back, I think. Okay, so we're going to, in the end, argue that I, you know, want to claim, I don't want to, like, oversell it, I don't want to say that we have the right answer, but, like, we think we have some good answers for being in that top right corner of performance and deployability. Uh, but before that, I want to talk about these fat trees, right, the modern data centers that we all kind of, uh, that, that everyone is actually using. So, you know, what's really interesting is fat trees come out of the theory community. Uh, right, so this is a 1985 paper by Charles Leisterson. Uh, uh, where he defined fat trees, and this is a, uh, on the right side, this is like a picture that I, you know, copied and pasted from the PDF of his, his paper. And you can kind of understand what's going on, right? So look at the left here, look at this tree, right? Like, so what's going on? I've got these things sitting at the base, right? And I've got links up to the next level, right? And these are like, you know, have capacity one or something that's normalizing, right? Let's say these links from the bottom level to the second level have like capacity one. Well, that means if I want to kind of enable all the all communication in a nice way, right, I need the next level links to have like capacity two, right? Like these links should have capacity two, right? And then like these links should have capacity four, right? So this is like all of that trees, right? It's a tree where as I go up, my links get kind of exponentially larger capacity in order to handle everything that lives beneath them. Right. And what kind of Charles argued is that like this is like back in 1985, right? This is like actually designing chips and supercomputers and things like this. Uh, right. He argued that you can like lay this all out, and this is kind of optimal in terms of like the volume uh, of laying this out on a chip, uh, which is a very cool. Like it's really interesting to go back and read these papers from you know four, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, and see how things have changed. Uh, Okay, so these are, you know, a great idea from the 80s. It's still a great idea today, even though the context is very different, right? Like building chips is very different from data centers. Still some good ideas here. Okay, so fat trees are like awesome for bandwidth, right? Like I've designed them so that I have this like exponentially increasing bandwidth. So kind of anyone who wants to communicate with anyone, like they can basically do it. It's great. But if you think about like doing this in a data center, Right, like we all know exponential growth is pretty fast, right? Like uh, I get these switches, especially at the top level that just need like absolutely insane bandwidth, right? Like, and, and how do you realize absolutely insane bandwidth? You realize it via kind of huge numbers of ports with like then parallel links, right? So you need these switches with just like unbelievably large uh, number of ports. Right? And these are like insanely expensive. And Cisco made a lot of money building these and selling these. Uh, they still do, but less so. Right? So, you know, how did we design data centers back in the day? Right? You try to buy these massive switches. They're still not big enough because uh, you know exponential growth is fast. Right? You buy the biggest ones you can. You try to put them in a tree, and then you add some stuff for redundancy that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, and you say, well, we tried to do a fat tree, but we couldn't because our switches aren't big enough. So we're oversubscribed by some factor, right? This is the, the language that networking people use. They call it oversubscription when you can't actually realize this exponential growth. So like, okay, uh, I, I tried, but I failed, uh, but we get as close as we can. Okay, so things changed. So this is this paper. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about this paper by uh, Alfaras, Lukisas, and, and Vidat uh, from SIGCOM. I should have the date here somewhere. Um, 
probably on the next slide, 08. Uh, so things changed with Padme in 2008. Uh, this is a super influential paper uh, coming out of UCSD, where they kind of tried to argue that you can build a fat tree, but I can build it using what they called commodity switches. Like, I don't need these like absolutely insane number of ports. Like, give me something with like still like a lot, like 16, 32, 48, you know, like some reasonable number of ports, right? And I can kind of build a fat tree out of them. Of course, it's not going to actually be a fat tree, right? Because fat trees is what it is, right? But it's going to be something that kind of acts like a fat tree. Uh, and interestingly, it, what they actually built is a class network, or even more technically, a folded class network. Uh, and I will say it was embarrassing for me how long I thought that CLOS was an acronym. Uh, it's not. It's a guy's name, uh, <laughs> CLOS. Uh, and, and this comes out of telephone networks from the 50s, right? It's so like we had fat trees from the 80s. Now we're going like back to the 50s uh, and Bell Labs building telephone networks. Uh, so this is designed for circuit switching. And this picture on the left is from CLOS's uh, paper on, on circuit switching. Uh, and he built some CLOS networks. It is, I find it at least, incredibly difficult to go back and try to read that paper and understand how the technology and the language like interacts with how we think about networks these days. Uh, it's a good exercise to do. Like I find it insanely difficult. Um, so just kind of take my word for it that you know he defined these networks, which if I reinterpret them and I squint my eyes and I think about it hard enough, uh, will correspond to what I'm talking about next. Uh, okay, so this is the famous picture from the Alfaris paper that everyone shows. This is directly, you know, copied and pasted from their paper. So, you know, this is on every slide deck about fat trees that uh, people have written since 2008. Uh, okay, so it looks like this. And this doesn't look necessarily like a fat tree, right? but I'm going to try to convince you that it kind of does. Right? So at the bottom, I've got my servers, and then I've got these layers of switches or of routers kind of uh, above. And the bottom level are called edge or top of rack switches, then I have these aggregation switches, then I have these core switches. Okay, this is how I, you should think about it, right? So like what's going on here? Like look at one of these bottom level routers, right? It's got two servers coming into it, right? Like just like I had before on my factory, right? So it's got two servers coming in. These things have like capacity one, right? The uplinks from those servers to that switch. Right, so now this switch at this bottom level is supposed to have capacity two up to the next level. Right, how do I do that? Well, I actually make the next level like a meta node, right? It's, it's gonna actually consist of two real switches, but I'm gonna kind of think of them as one switch. Right, so if I think of these two uh, as just like one switch, right, then yeah, like, you know, this guy, uh, whoops, whoops, um, I lost my thing again. Oh, well, hopefully that's okay. Like if I think of, uh, you know, this aggregation, these two uh, nodes in that aggregation level as one node, then the edge node that's beneath it kind of has a capacity two up to it. Right, and similarly, if I think of all four of those core switches as one big switch, right, then all of these kind of two node aggregation meta switches have capacity four, right, up to the core, right? So this is like what I want, right? This is what's, what the, the capacities I should have in the factory, right? These exponentially increasing capacities, right? But because I'm using, in this case, all my switches have capacity four or have, have degree four, right? Like I'm doing this kind of without buying this like um, eight switch or 16 switch or like, you know, much higher port uh, switches that I would need uh, to build the actual fat tree. Okay, so that's like intuitively what's going on, right? And this is again, like should not be a shock to anyone who's like done any work at all in like graph algorithms or graphs, right? Like I want to kind of simulate a high degree node via a bunch of low degree nodes, right? It's like, okay, like I do that. Right. And of course, it matters how I do that. Like there's some technical stuff that goes on here. Right. But like, that's the idea. Okay. So here's the details. I'm not really going to spend time on it. I'll just talk about it quick. Right. So this picture uh, on the left here, right. This is what I just showed on the last thing. This is for uh, degree four. This is the same thing for degree six. 
at the bottom. Right? You can kind of think about what goes on in this uh, in the Alfaro's paper. It's always a three-level thing. Uh, you think about it for degree k, you end up when you think about what's going on, you get k cubed over four servers, five k squared over four switches. You arrange them in a certain way. Like, okay, this is what happens. Uh, right? So go and look at the details. It's understandable. It's not too hard to read. Um, uh, but it's it's a fat tree where you have simulated the high degree nodes with many low degree nodes. Okay, so class networks, like I said, uh, are a generalization, uh, right? So class networks are how we do the simulation of high degree nodes via low degree nodes. Uh, you can generalize a bit, right? So for example, you can generalize more than three levels. And I think Stefan actually had a pointer to this. I will also point to it. Uh, he has a nice paper with Von Kammer and Alsasser in the upcoming disk where he just does some nice local fast rerouting, but he does it like for class networks. And so there's a nice definition in there that's understandable to theory people, right? Of what like a L level class network is instead of just a three level one. Uh, so you can kind of go look it up there, but it's exactly what you expect, right? Take your L level fat tree with exponential increase and stuff, simulate it appropriately. That's what a class network is. Uh, you can generalize it in slightly other ways, right? So. This is a famous picture from what's called the VL2 paper. Uh, so VL2 was Microsoft version of this UCSD paper. Uh, and it's basically the same thing, except they have like a different degree at the top of that, right? So the lowest level has a different degree than the upper levels. But like other than that, it's all basically the same. Um, and this has become like the totally dominant paradigm, right? So variants of this, maybe have yeah, two different degrees or something like this, right? But like basically this kind of setup is what you have. So there's this nice paper from SIGCOM 2015 out of Google, which says, we've been using class networks with centralized control for a decade. Here's the variance we've gone through. Here's what we're doing now. This is as of 2015, so things have changed since then, right? But okay, this is still now, instead of a decade, it's been 15 years. This is, is what people do. And this is how modern data centers run uh, on variants of these class networks, these fat trees. Okay, cool. Uh, so fat trees are nice, lots of cool stuff. Uh, there's some downsides, right? They, they're not the most efficient thing you can do. Uh, and I'll point out that they're also somehow like very fixed, right? So, you know, I said you get uh, K cubed over four servers. Like, okay, right? Like what if I want somewhere in between that, right? Like for different values of K, that's a very fixed number, right? Like what do you do if you need stuff in between? How do you build a data center that I can expand later into a bigger one, um, right? Like these are all kind of issues that happen when you use these class networks. Uh, so we're gonna propose expander data centers. So I see I have like seven minutes left, so I'll just be fast. Right, so like I said, we have these kind of three papers. Let me give you the high level view of what they do. Right, so the, the Conex paper, uh, which is what I'm gonna be talking about for the next like five minutes, uh, is like the systems paper. This says like, here's a system, we have simulations of it, we have emulations of it, we think it's good, like, you know, go play with it. Um, we have this Journal of Common Trial Theory paper, where what we can show is that SlimFly in particular, but even this other class of proposals, right? So like we propose expanders, other people propose this other set of graphs called degree diameter graphs. We kind of argue just purely graph theoretically, those degree diameter graphs are expanders. So kind of our proposal like subsumes these other proposals. Um, so that's kind of a cool graph theoretic fact. Um, and then uh, we have this uh, algorithmic paper, uh, which uh, predates the other ones, but that's kind of an accident of the order in which these things were accepted. Uh, it really kind of what this shows is that like, if you take this particular expander that we use from our Conex paper, um, then I can modify it and get some other nice properties that actually the constants there aren't quite good enough for us to claim they're useful in the systems paper. So that's like the open question is that there's like super interesting algorithms there and we have good constants, but we need better constants if we're going to claim it's like actually useful in practice. Um, okay, but our starting point is this paper from NSDI 2012, which is probably my single favorite systems paper of the last uh, decade. Uh, so it's coming out of UIUC and out of Brighton Godfrey's group in particular. And I would recommend for anyone who's interested in kind of theory of networking, like just like go look at like what Brighton does, 
So he started out his career as a theory PhD student at Berkeley before he switched to systems. So like everything he does, not everything, but a lot of what he does has like a theory intuition behind it. Not like the full blown theory, but like he has really good theory intuition and he uses that to build really good systems. Uh, so, you know, go talk with Brighton. He's awesome. Um, so he had this paper in NSDI that kind of said, you know what? We don't, we want to go to the opposite of fat trees. Right? Like, what is the opposite of these super highly designed, super highly engineered things? Like, let's just use random graphs. Right? So they call it jellyfish because like the image he has in our mind, right? Is like, there's just like cables thrown everywhere, right? Like a jellyfish. Um, and what he shows is like performance wise, these things are amazing. Like take any metric you care about and jellyfish is like using a random graph is like better than using a fat tree, uh, more or less. Um, and what he actually cared about here was this incremental expandability, right? So he said that like, I wanna be able to add like a node at a time or something like this. And how do I do that? Like I kind of add a node, I kind of remove some random edges then I add in some random edges and I'm basically still random and now I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the details, but basically he shows that you can kind of uh, do this, right? On the other hand, you have these issues, right? Like as the picture of jellyfish in your mind kind of shows, like the idea of actually cabling this seems like a disaster, right? Like uh, actually running these through a warehouse seems super scary. Uh, and there's also this like psychological issue, these hard to reason about issues, right? Like proposing to network operators, like, you know, don't worry about it. Just like plug in wires randomly. Like that, that's like a tough sell <laughs> to people who have spent their careers thinking very carefully about how to plug in wires. Um, yeah, so okay, so what we want, right, is like the benefits of random graphs without the randomness. Right, and this like should not be a shock to anyone who has worked in graph theory, right? Like what is a non-random random graph, right, an expander. Uh, so I'm kind of out of time. So an expander is just a graph where like all the cuts are really good. Uh, it turns out for technical reasons, we're going to want to talk more about spectral expansion than about common trial expansion, but that's all in the paper. So go read the paper if you want to see the details. Um, maybe we care about throughput. So this is um, a, a metric that uh, Giotti et al. kind of argued is, it's not the only possible metric, but it's one metric that encompasses a lot of other stuff. So it's basically the max concurrent flow, right? So say I've got traffic demands between pairs. Uh, what is the max concurrent flow, right? As theory people, we all like max concurrent flow. Um, what is that? Let's call that the throughput, right? And I can choose different demand network, different uh, traffic demands and get different, uh, different results here. Right, so expanders are good, right? Here's a bunch of theorems that like are basically just classical stuff from the expander literature, uh, reinterpreted in light of this notion of throughput. Uh, you can go back and look through all these old expander papers and think about what that means for this throughput. You can kind of say that for all to all demands, any expanders within log D of the optimum for, you know, you give me the traffic demands, I design my network based on those demands. Now I compare like my expander built without knowing those demands, right? Okay, if it's all the all demands, I'm within log D of the optimum. If it's arbitrary demands, I'm within log N of the optimum. And I can't do better than log N. This is all just like classical stuff. In practice, like the cost is matter. This O of log N is not super convincing to like actual networking people, right? So we have a particular expander based on BLU lineal. So I'm out of time. So I'll just say BLU lineal is this beautiful paper that shows like a construction of expanders, right? There's not that many known constructions of expanders. One of them is the lineal. It's unbiased, but I think it's probably the nicest and easiest to understand and kind of most reasonable notion of expanders. So if you haven't seen it, if you've only seen like the zigzag product or Cayley graphs or something horrible like that, go look at the lineal. It's a much nicer construction. So we can use it, but you can de-randomize it. We can build it incrementally. It's a nice construction. Expander with an X, because Xs are cool, is our uh, system uh, that uses this. Um, it has amazing throughput. Uh, we're at least as good as jellyfish and you know, jellyfish, like the way we sell this paper is that you know, jellyfish convinced everyone that they have the best possible performance. They're just not usable. We have at least as good performance as jellyfish. So you should not be worried about our performance. 
um, were kind of much more efficient. So using like the, for the same number of servers compared to a fat tree, we use like far fewer switches, we get higher throughput, uh, things are better. The elephant in the room is cabling complexity. Uh, I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna do this. Like, you know, we thought about this like very closely. We figured out like, how would you lay these out in an actual warehouse? Here's the number of feet you would have between the aisles. Uh, like you can kind of think about this. Uh, we did it. You can kind of show that we can, you know, use fewer cables or smaller cables or less total cabling. Uh, or kind of, and then you can crunch the numbers on how much this costs money-wise. This is what we did as of like five years ago. Uh, like we're cheaper and you can actually cable it in a reasonable way because BLU lineal is like super highly structured, right? Just like existing things, um, but gets the performance of jellyfish. Okay, so I'm out of time. I'll just say that expanders, you know, are the right data center topologies. If you use the right expander, then I would argue that they're actually deployable and usable, but you know, it's important which expander you choose. Uh, if you're a pod C or disk person doing distributed algorithms and you want to talk something about data centers, like that's awesome, go do it. But like, make sure you know what, how data centers work uh, before you make, start making claims. And you can talk about fat trees, you can talk about expanders. Those are all reasonable things to be doing. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Thank you, Rat, for this very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? So one uh, so, question in the chat, could you please yeah. specify some theory open questions? Ah, uh, good. So there's kind of two levels, I would say, of open questions, right? There's levels of like theory open questions for how do I design better data centers? And then there's theory open questions for once I have my data centers designed this way, what are the interesting kind of algorithmic questions that are kind of involved in using them? Right? So these are both interesting. Uh, I spent more time thinking about the former. But there's some very specific open questions uh, from our work. Um, we'll say like from, uh, I don't have to, I won't try to find the slide. Right? So like this incremental expandability. Right? So for example, we uh, have in our ESA paper, the, uh, our algorithmic paper, a way of taking BLU lineal and building it up one node at a time. So BLU lineal is usually defined as building up by powers of two. We show you can kind of do it one node at a time instead of powers of two. We pay for that. Uh, and we pay what look from a theory point of view like small constants, but are not acceptable, right? So for example, our combinatorial expansion, uh, BLU lineal is like a Ramanujan graph or a quasi Ramanujan graph. So it has combinatorial expansion of basically D over two, like D over two minus like root log D or something like this. And we get like D over three for a combinatorial expansion. Right? So D over three sounds like pretty close to D over two. This is not like zigzag product where it's like D over a million, uh, right? Like th these are actually pretty good expanders, but that's actually not reasonable from a data center point of view. Like we can't, we can't do D over three. That's too much of a loss. So getting this one at a time incremental expansion in a way that preserves Ramanujan-ness or quasi Ramanujan-ness um, is like a super interesting open question. Uh, the, and, and this, you know, um, shows up when you start talking about spectral, uh, right? So like D over three and D over two start looking much, much bigger when you talk about spectral expansion, right? This is the difference between, uh, like a huge gap in my spectrum. Uh, similarly, like when you're building things up one at a time, you know, this question of how, you know, when I'm adding in a new node, how many edges do I have to remove and how many edges do I have to add? Right? I'm adding in a new node, it's got degree D, so I have to increase, I have to add in at least D edges, right? Because like this node has to have D edges. And then I have to make room for that, right? So I have to like remove at least D over two edges from my current graph, right? So like three D over two edge, edge swaps is like the minimum you could possibly ask for. And we show like five D over two uh, in our construction. That's, a gap is not as important of a gap as the like gap in the, the expansion, but it's still a gap that would be nice to remove. So one set of open questions is just like actually getting the tight bounds that we can't, that we don't get. Um, but then there's kind of all these other questions, right? Of like, okay, like we use BLU lineal. What about other expanders? Can I do this incremental expansion on them? 
Uh, can I use them in data centers? Can I argue about wiring and other kinds of expanders, right? And there's actually theory questions there about physical layout, right? So yes, that's practical, but it's also theory, right? About where I place these in two dimensional, in the two dimensional plane and, and how I have a cost metric for that. Um, and then there's a bunch of questions about routing in, in these guys, right? So I didn't show this, but you know, a key part of our system is that like you can't use this then kind of vanilla routing schemes. If you try to use like shortest path routing with ECMP, which is how routing works in a lot of data centers uh, nowadays, like expanders are not good because this kind of routing can't take advantage of the bandwidth that expanders provide. You have to use, we have to use like multi-path TCP, uh, right? We have to use like more complicated routing schemes that aren't, aren't crazy, right? These are still like, these are systems routing schemes, but they're not the vanilla ones. So trying to figure out like, are there other expanders where you can use the vanilla routing schemes? Are there other kinds of routing schemes or congestion control that make these expanders like even better? Um, these are all like interesting theory questions. Uh, yeah, so it's a good mix of like theory and applied, right? They're all theory questions, but you have to kind of know some of the applied stuff uh, to talk about them. But, but at the end of the day, they are just pure theory questions. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, thank you a lot. So I think we can thank the speaker again and more thank the first three speakers of this session. Feel free to unmute the upload or uh, make uh, some reaction on, on Zoom. So this is the end of this first session.